Here I'm going to go through uh, the fifth IVFRQ. This is a paper two style question on organic chemistry. So if you would like to try the problem first, go ahead and pause this video now. There's a link to the Google Doc with this problem in the description below, as well as some other problems if you want more help after. Uh, so here it starts off by saying what's the class of compound A right here, and then also what is the functional group that the arrow points to. So the class is going to be the type of molecule, in this case it's an alcohol, would be the class this belongs to, whereas the functional group is the specific part of the molecule that shows this particular reactivity. So this is actually called a hydroxyl group, even though people will commonly refer to it as an alcohol group. Okay, so the hydroxyl is the component of the molecule, whereas the class is the type of molecule, and this kind of fits into the uh, homologous series, where if we had ethanol, propanol, butanol, that those would be homologous series within that class. Okay? Now in part two it says draw a conformational isomer in the box below. So to do that, what we're going to do is we're going to pretend that we have an eyeball right here, staring down this particular molecule, and it's looking right at this carbon here. We're going to draw a little dot for that. And then this carbon here, we have a second carbon that's, that we're kind of looking from the first through the second. So our, our vision is going this way. What would we see? So first of all, we would see a hydroxyl group going up. And then this hydrogen is, is in front of the plane. This would be down into our left. And then this one over here is down into the right because it's behind the plane of the board. Now on the other side, we have a staggered conformation here. We have this hydrogen coming out to this side. And then this one's behind the board, so from my eye's perspective, it'd be off to my right. And then I have one more coming straight down, this one right here. So it says draw a conformational isomer. So a conformational isomer is the same molecule, it's just been rotated about one of its bonds. So when I draw this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the, the carbon here that I have the blue dot on the same. But then I'm going to rotate the back carbon so that it has a hydrogen in line with this hydroxyl group, it has another hydrogen in line with this hydrogen, and then another hydrogen here. So we're going from a staggered conformation where everything's 60 degrees apart to one that is eclipsed, where everything is in line together. Okay. Now, molecules like this are going to rotate from one of these forms to the other all the time at any reasonable temperature. So we're going from a 60 degree gap to a zero degree gap this is less stable because now these two things are very close together and it's going to lead to some repulsion. However, it's not that unstable because nothing on here is very bulky. Okay, now the change that is occurring that's leading to this switching between this mode and this mode is that there's a rotation about the sigma bond. Okay, if we had pi bonds that would lock this in place, it wouldn't be able to rotate without breaking it. There's a rotation about the sigma bond between the two carbons. So all I'm doing is giving this a twist, and microwave radiation would be something that would be capable of causing that to go. Okay, so down for number three here, we have methanol, I'm sorry, ethanol to start. And it says, what will we get from the following reagents? So in the MnO4 minus an acid catalyst, we're going to be doing an oxidation. So this is a primary alcohol, so it's going to start off by turning into an aldehyde. And then if we reflux that and let that continue to react, that will end up making a carboxylic acid, ethanoic acid. We'll likely get some of both, regardless of whether we reflux it or not. Uh, and and so if just one of those is what you wanted, you could separate those by their boiling points through a uh, distillation apparatus. Okay. The second reaction, we're taking this and reacting with a bromide ion from, from either a salt or an acid uh, in, a, in an apolar protic solvent. I'm sorry. Yeah, apolar protic solvent. Uh, and so we're going to end up with a substitution reaction. So the bromide is going to substitute out the hydroxide, and we're going to end up with bromoethane. Um, and in part C it says, draw the curly arrow mechanism for this particular reaction, this conversion from here to here. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with our ethanol. And 
show how that transformation takes place. We're going to include all of our electrons and everything. So we have this and we have a bromide. So first thing we have to decide is, is this going to be SN1 or SN2? Because that's going to determine how the mechanism goes. This is a, this carbon with the leaving group on it is primary. There's only one other carbon attached right here. So that's going to lead towards SN2 being the favored mechanism. Now what's going to happen in SN2 is this is going to come in. It's going to form a bond with that carbon. While that's happening, this bond is going to break. Those electrons are going to stay with the hydroxide as that leaves. Okay, so we we'll always draw an arrow from the electrons to where the bonding site is. Now, for IB, what you would then want to draw is you'd want to draw this in a transition state, showing that you know that these two things occur at the exact same time. So we have kind of our fragment here, and then we have a dashed line showing that the hydroxide group is leaving, and another dashed line showing that this bromide is forming a bond. Okay, so here's our activated complex, if you will. And then when we're done, we're going to end up with a hydroxide ion, as well as we're going to end up with this alkyl halide. And for us, it's going to be the bromoethane. Now, there's one last thing that's very important for this, and that is you do need to include your charges. So I have a negative charge in the bromide ion to begin negative charge in the hydroxide ion at the end, and this transition state also has a net negative charge on it from those two things. Okay. Now in part D it says justify why you chose SN1 or SN2. Okay. So, so I'm going to do my justification up here and get rid of this. The justification is, well the starting justification is, for, so first of all we picked SN2, and the reason for that is because there's a primary carbon with a leaving group in this case the hydroxyl group. And that does two things. Number one, it gives you a low steric hindrance to, to the SN2 mechanism, meaning there's not a lot of bulk to get in the way of this going down. So, so these two hydrogens are not going to block this bromide from coming in and colliding with that carbon. The second thing is, is you have a very unstable carbocation intermediate for a primary carbon because you have a positive charge without a lot of electron density nearby to draw from. Only this carbon really. Hydrogens don't have a lot of electrons and they already given up a lot as is. So, so it's not going to be able to pull as much to stabilize. So that's going to slow down the SN1 reaction and the SN2 then is going to dominate. Now, in the event that this were a secondary carbon, then we're looking at, well, we've got to look at some other factors. We'd have to look at our solvent, our nucleophile, and our leaving group. Like, our, our leaving group is not a good one here. We'd prefer to have an acid catalyst and turn this into water. The bromide here is a good nucleophile. That's going to help for SN2. And our solvent was a dimethyl sulfoxide, so that's a polar aprotic. So that's not going to hinder this very much, and that's going to allow SN2 to go. But, but for all of these, for, for this one in particular, because it's a primary carbon, none of that is going to trump the fact that it's a primary carbon, and that's going to be your main route for that reaction.